Welcome to AHSC TV's Weekly Roundup. In this week's program, killings continue in Bangladesh. Shamila marks 15 years of hunger strike against AFSPA in Manipur. Nepal's second universal periodic review held in Geneva. Historic Burma parliamentarian elections coming up next week. Sri Lanka debates the rights of protesters after police attack students. Welcome to HSC TV's Weekly Roundup. I'm Josefina Bergsten. The spree of targeted assassinations of secular writers and publishers continues in Bangladesh, sending the country further into lawlessness and terror. Faisal Arafin Deepan, owner of a publishing house, is the latest victim. He was hacked to death in his office on November 1st. The slain victim's publishing house is known for publishing books whose authors has diverse socio-political and religious ideas, including a book written by secular blogger Abhijit Roy, who was murdered earlier this year. Mainstream media and police officials are blaming pro-Islamist militant groups for this murder and that of five other bloggers assassinated in Bangladesh since February 2013. Curiously, the latest victim's father, Abdul Kashem Fazul Haq, a University of Dhaka professor, has been cited in the media immediately after the murder of his son as saying, I do not want justice. Those who are doing politics in the name of secularism and those who are doing politics over state religion, both are destroying the nation. Let there be good sense among them. For more on this, AHSC TV spoke with Mohammed Ashraf Zaman, who works on Bangladesh as well as UN issues at the Asian Human Rights Commission. Regarding the assassination of Faisal Arifin Deepan. Uh, uh, one misinformation has came in the media that he was a blogger. His family asserts that he was not a blogger, he was just a publisher. His publishing house used to publish a lot of books and uh, one book of slain uh, blogger uh, Avijit Rai his publishing house published in recent years. Uh, apart from that, he did not write anything, any comment in, in any social networking site or any website. There is another area about uh, uh, this assassination is that Professor Abul Qasim Fazlul Haq has publicly said immediately after uh, the assassination of his son that I don't want justice. So, which is very significant in the context of Bangladesh because many ordinary people don't want to go to the judicial system uh, because of their experiences. And this professor is also saying that he doesn't want justice. And there are examples, for example, five uh, more bloggers have been assassinated in last uh, two years or so. And uh, you can see that there is no credible action in, in investigating those crimes and prosecuting the uh, actual offend offenders and none of these are transparently done. So people simply do not have faith on the judicial system uh, and that uh, everybody should concentrate to at the moment that why this trust is being lost from the judiciary and what the judiciary itself should do to bringing back the trust and, uh, and what is actually their role they are expected to play, they are legally and constitutionally obliged to play which they are not doing at the moment. Uh, one last thing is that Professor Abul Qasim Fazlul Haq has uh, said before the media on 4th of November that since the independence of Bangladesh in 1971, he has never felt such insecure what he was feeling on that day. Uh, because uh, his family is receiving death threats from ident unidentified callers. So it indicates the freedom of expression in the country, the freedom of other democratic rights and very importantly the independence of the judiciary without which the people cannot survive and they cannot breathe in, in a society. So everybody should concentrate to that and how to 
uh, redevelop this, how to bring back democracy in the country and uh, uh, ensure that the country becomes a rule of law state. Across the border from Bangladesh, in the Manipur state in northeast India, Eram Sharmila has this week completed 15 years of hunger strike. She is demanding the repeal of the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, or AFSPA, which was enacted more than 50 years ago. AFSPA gives security forces the right to use lethal force and arrest people without a warrant in areas deemed as disturbed. Thousands of innocent people have been killed over the years, and the perpetrators act with impunity, protected by the act. Shamila, a 42-year-old poet and human rights defender, began her hunger strike in November 2000 after she witnessed a brutal attack by the paramilitary force Assam Rifles, in which 10 innocent people were killed in Manipur. Ever since, she has been held in judicial custody and force-fed through a tube, accused of attempted suicide, a crime under Section 309 of the Indian Penal Code. Attempted suicide is punishable with up to a year in prison. Shamila herself states that she is not attempting to commit suicide by hunger striking, but exercising her constitutional right to protest. Nevertheless, each year Shamila is released and then immediately re-arrested. This has continued for 15 years and Shamila has pledged to continue her protest until AFSPA is repealed. There have been repeated calls and legal verdict over the years, both domestically and internationally, to repeal AFSPA and release Shamila. Earlier, HSC TV spoke with Pablo Lotongbam in Manipur. This week marks the completion of 15 years of Irom Sharmila's hunger strike. And um, we, as a supporter of her struggle and in solidarity with her uh, epic struggle, uh, have started off commemorating this completion of 15 years with a uh, convention uh, in Delhi, uh, where um, civil society groups from across the country have come and showed solidarity to her. One of the highlights of this commemoration uh, is uh, also to, to lobby with uh, the political leadership in India uh, to make a headway in terms of um, the, the demand that she is making, and there are some progress. Unfortunately, the leadership in, in, in the government of Manipur has been as indifferent as they have always been. I had an opportunity to meet her on the 31st uh, of October, and uh, she has now, in a way, come to accept her situation. Uh, she now also wants that more people, more prominent people, should come and support her statement that he is making inside the court because all these cases are going on against her and uh, she wants defense witnesses for her to come and say she is not on a suicide mission, she is there uh, for a political cause and this uh, falsely charging her as attempt to commit suicide should be refuted by more prominent people from the society and this is, this is her desire. We are also condemning the complete insensitivity of the Indian state on the issue that she is raising, namely the repeal of the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. Almost every human rights monitoring body in the United Nations has come out clearly saying that this is in violation of international law, violation of human rights law, violation of humanitarian law even. And now over to Nepal, which this week underwent its second cycle of Universal Periodic Review, or UPR, in Geneva. The Nepal government made promises during the last UPR review in January 2011 that it would step up and improve the weak human rights situation in the country. Nepal has largely failed to take effective action and live up to its commitments. Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs Kamal Tapa headed the Nepalese delegation. Also present were representatives from the National Human Rights Commission and members from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, as well as the Commission Against Enforced Disappearances. Various civil society members, including advocates working on human rights, also participated in the UPR. Here are some excerpts from UNTV. The fundamental goal of the new government 
elected a few weeks back is so effectively is to effectively implement the new constitution by removing the structural and functional obstacles, challenges in the way of socio-economic transformation of the country. The government has started to take necessary measures to formulate necessary legislative and policy tools needed for the smooth operationalization of the constitution. In fact, we are currently at a very delicate situation resulting from the obstruction of essential supplies at the border points. Lives and livelihood of the entire population have been adversely affected. Schools and hospitals also bear the bond of current circumstances exposing millions of children, elderly and sick persons to greater risk and vulnerabilities. The future of our children is at stake. Our regional and international trade have been constrained. Our industries are on the verge of collapse. The tourism sector has been hit hard. Our economy has suffered a huge setback. If the current trend is not checked, the country is likely to experience an unjust and severe humanitarian crisis. This needs to be avoided. While we seek to address political problem through dialogue, the continuous obstruction at border points under any pretext has severely impeded the exercise of rights and freedom that Nepal is entitled under the international law as a landlocked country. Nepal is a party to the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhumane and Degrading Treatment, but has still not ratified the optional protocol. Denmark therefore recommends that Nepal ratifies the optional protocol to the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhumane or Degrading Treatment or Punishment. Nepal has carried out positive improvements regarding the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Disappearance Act. However, the implementation process remains slow. Denmark therefore recommends that Nepal amends the 2014 Commission on Investigation of Disappeared Persons, Truth and Reconciliation Act in compliance with the Supreme Court ruling of 26 February 2015 in order to uphold international standards relating to accountability for gross violations of international human rights and international humanitarian law. I thank you. Burma's historic parliament election is due to be held next week on November 8. This election is seen by some as an opportunity for the country's first free and fair elections in 25 years and that the future of democratic reform will depend on the outcome of this election. The central issue of the election is whether military rule in Burma can be replaced with a democratic form of government. The opposition party and many civil society organizations have expressed concern whether a free or fair election will be possible. Opposition leader Aung San Suu Kyi has called for vigorous international monitoring of the election. UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in Myanmar, Yan Hee Lee, has stated that the restriction on freedom of expression, assembly and association and the arrest and excessive use of force against protesters poses serious risks for holding a genuine election. She has pointed out that migrant workers, internally displaced people, refugees, Burmese citizens living abroad and those living in conflict and flood affected areas will not be able to vote. Reports about several attacks on opposition candidates and members are also threatening the electoral process. For more on this, AHSC TV spoke with Burmese human rights defender Min Win O. เออโนมาเสียนี่มาเจ้าหน้าที่มาเนี่ยมาเนี่ยเอ่อถือดีกว่าไปลงมาเนาะถือดีกว่าไปลงมาสุรกาคู่เจนที่เจ้าหน้า
ตะไคคาเกษตรที่ผัวเกเรสุราจนรู้ตี้อะเตสัญญาปาดีดีก็ตันจาทาบีเมเลยยุยกอบวยกอมชินนี่ที่ยอกสวาอีอยู่ซอง